Welcome to another episode of Perukei Avot. We are on, still on chapter 6, Mishnah 6, and we're going to do, but not to show the last part of this Mishnah, which is going to be extremely informative and exciting. So, we dedicate this episode as ever in memory of Levi Mamashev Esther and Elisha Vayal Badei Levi, and also in memory of Yisrael Ben Binyamin Verivka. Okay, I'm going to hand you over to Michael. Thank you, Rav Mashiach. So, this episode, which is the fourth of four of uh, uh, Perek 6, Mishnah 6, we conclude the last attributes of this evolution of a Talmud Chacham. And these last uh, set of qualities, according to Abba Benel, are qualities found only in the exceptional or outstanding heads of each generation. Um, just to recap the uh, last episode's um, attributes that we mentioned um, were... I will just just describe the titles. 23, uh, by faith and scholars. 24, by accepting life's afflictions. 25, by being a person who recognizes his place. Number 26, is happy with his lot. 27, makes offense around his words. Number 28, does not claim merit for himself. 29 is beloved by other people for his good attributes. Number 30 loves Hashem. Number 31 loves mankind in general. 32 loves uh, righteousness and rightness of character. 33 loves reproofs or to be uh, corrected. And number 34, someone who keeps far from honor. So those are the previous episode's attributes. Now we're going to move on to the final section of uh, set of attributes. So, number 35. He does not fill his heart with pride over his learning. So this follows logically from the 34th attribute, which is keeping far from honor. Uh, By... by, uh, by not um, filling his heart with pride, he won't develop an overweening pride in his learning. Otherwise, he expects accolades, which perhaps he doesn't yet deserve. Um, also, a Talmud Chacham will become aware of the part that Hashem plays in his mastery of the Torah. Hashem, as we read in, uh, as we read in the Amida. Um, we, uh, Hashem endows us with intelligence, understanding, and memory, and gives us the opportunity to study. Um, and also, we've learned that the devotion of his studying is not more than his allotted task in life, which is what he's created for. Therefore, the more he studies, the more he is aware of the vast amount of learning that still awaits him. Only a man of little erudition can grow boastful of the vast treasures of his own mind. As the Talmud puts it in uh, Eruvin 55a, a single, um, sorry, in Baba Metziah 85b, a single coin in an empty vessel makes the loud clanging noise. And his very pride rather guarantees that he will learn little more. After all, he considers it unfit to seek knowledge from anyone that's on a lower level than him. In the Torah's words, this is not in heaven, comments Rava, and I quote this from uh, Eruvin 55 on Madalaf, it will not be found in someone who considers himself on its account as exalted as heaven. So your ego must be kept in check uh, on this uh, evolution. You're now becoming masterful in your craft, in your learning of Torah, and don't get don't get a swollen head. Uh, keep your feet on the ground. Your you know your face close to your books rather than in the clouds. Number thirty six. He does not take delight in giving decisions. 
So once he is now on an exalted level of Torah mastery, you must not try and be a know-it-all uh, or, um, um, or, or what, what you have to be as a... Um, when you are asked to give decisions based on your Torah knowledge, you must hesitate long and hard before rendering a decision on which others will base their actions. Abba Manel writes, who himself was a leader of his people and he was a court advisor to a king. And I quote him, The man of unusual wisdom who stands out in his generation realizes how feeble is human understanding. Therefore, he will not rejoice at giving decisions and legal rulings, knowing that error can easily enter into reasoning, reflection, or study. End quote. And he also mentions Rabbi Yosef ben Chalafta, before whom two people came to settle a dispute on condition that you judge us by the law of the Torah. The, he replied, I do not know the law of the Torah. Rather, let the one who knows all the thoughts, referring to Hashem, let him settle the accounts of these people. You have to accept whatever I will say to you. In other words, he's just an oracle for God in this situation. And, um, you know, he knew, uh, Rav Yosef ben Chalafta knew that being human, that these people could lie to him. And um, he could only give a verdict on what he thought was right, and with no guarantees that it was just. But if one of them did anything or tried to gain anything by lying, he warned that HaKadosh Baruch Hu would give the final verdict, and that would be just. Also, just to show the uh, importance and the seriousness that the Rabbonim used to take these uh, these positions in the base din. When Rav would enter the base din to serve as judge, he would say of himself, and I quote, of his own free will, will does he go to face death. To the needs of his household, he will not attend there, for he will go home empty-handed. And would that his departure be as his entrance? Um, he knew that bad decisions, for bad decisions of his own, as a kind of, uh, or someone who's sitting on the base din, Hashem could punish him for making bad decisions on other people's behalf. Also, you don't, you put your own jeopardy, your welfare, uh, on the line by acting as a judge because you don't, you know, you don't get paid for working so called on the bench. You know, the judges didn't receive a fee for their work. Um, but to the base din, uh, Rav still went, knowing that his learning uh, befitted him to serve as a judge. And also, I think we learned in Rambam, um, uh, made reference to the importance of um, being a pious person as a judge. And obviously to be unbiased, but to maintaining the highest traits of moral perfection. Because the judge has a direct communication with Hashem. Sometimes he, Rambam used to say, or used to suggest in his teachings, that a judge should follow his heart. Which is a funny thing when, you, uh, when you're giving legal decisions, because you think a judge should just go by the book, so to speak. But he used to suggest this. This perhaps was because they had such upright people and such uh, pure people that uh, divinations from God uh, and just judgments from God were often, they were just oracles of Hashem if they reached these higher, the higher states of consciousness. Number 37, he should bear the yoke with his fellow. So the authentic Talmud Chacham must not be a loner. He has to get involved in all chores of Jewish life. He has to get involved in regulating kashrut, finding support for older people, community things like building mikvahs, helping schools. Uh, all of these things he must not uh, um, separate himself from. Whatever demands are made from him via the community, the Talmud Chacham, 
must be ready to bear the yoke with his fellow. You know, if you see someone in trouble, you uh, you feel you have to help. And um, sometimes if you see someone who's, who's really in trouble, you sometimes you, 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 you take yourself out of the situation and uh, you don't want to get involved. But here we are told you have to bear a yoke with your fellow. You have to feel everything that he does, share his burden, share his pain and suffering. Because you have made his plight your own, so you must help him. This is profound human kinship that grows in the world of Torah. It is one of the basic reasons why the world of Torah has endured since its beginnings. Number 38. Judges him favorably. So in this literal meaning, the Hebrew refers to the image of the scales of justice with its two pans evenly balanced, one on either side. <clears throat> when someone is to be judged for something he has done, we imagine that every possible accusation against him is put on one pan and every element in his favor on the other pan. Then we see which goes lower, indicating obviously which is heavier. And according, we declare the person innocent or guilty or good and bad. So suppose you've seen a neighbor doing something which from one point of view is a misdeed, but in another respect may be a good act. In the figurative scales of justice that measure the deed, says our text, the scholar of Torah will see that pan bending lower, which declares his neighbor innocent and worthy. <clears throat> so this makes him feel the pain, the pan of merit weighs more. He gives his fellow fully and readily the benefit of the doubt, in keeping with Rabbi Yeshua ben Parachia's uh, teaching of the first Perak Mishnah 6. Um, in fact, um, the, the uh, Torah admonishes, and, and I quote from Leviticus 19.15, With righteousness shall you judge your neighbor, which the sages understand in this very sense. You must judge him favorably. Number 39. Leads him onto truth. We learn in Yumiyahu chapter 10, verses 10, the seal of the Holy Blessed One is truth, and the Lord God is truth. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, the, the Torah refers uh, constantly to a Kodesh Baruch Hu as Tzor, or the rock, um, implying a solid base where man can stand, build, and be an anchor for his life and values. Therefore, the Talmud Chacham, who gives his years to master the Torah uh, and to find in it guidance of Hashem's truth uh, for man and uh, on earth. Um, and he must be able to uh, place his trust in Hashem uh, for, to, um, to uh, deliver the truth. So having distilled the truth of Torah to illuminate his life, the Talmud Chacham that we talk about will transmit it freely and clearly to his fellow um, Jews and people without any sort of sophistry or equivocation, um, which is ultimately, the truth is ultimately what is distilled from uh, this sort of perseverance through mastering a Torah life. Number 40, and leads him on to peace. So without this so-called rock, uh, which is a stabilizing anchor of the Torah, um, your life can be a kind of ridden with anxieties. Um, um, many find themselves living nervously, and especially nowadays, your tensions rise, and and can uh, can you can't find any peace or harmony in your life, but with the Torah's truth, this evolved Talmud Chacham achieves him, achieves within himself peace, and he is able to be a blessing to those around him, and he guides others to their to similar states of spiritual tranquility. Uh, and peace. Number 41, he becomes composed in his study. So the plain meaning of this is that no matter how learned or distinguished a scholar he has become, 
He will take care to calmly review and consider his learning before replying to any question in Torah. He can't afford to be flustered into any errors. As uh, Abar Banel notes, as we read in the Torah, um, the Lord said to Moshe, Come up to me upon the mountain and be there, and I will give you the tablets of stone and the Torah and the commandments. This is from Exodus 24.12. Not even Moshe Rabbeinu could receive the Torah all at once. He had to be there long enough to master it properly. Um, <clears throat> number 42, asks and answers. So these two are very much related. So much so, they're actually one trait in uh, all quality. To ask and answer is, a, is two sides of the same coin. For when a Talmud Chacham that we're talking about here asks a question, it is not a thoughtless why of a unlearned person uh, or just a kind of... Um, a, uh, a heretical sort of question. It is the guiding movement of an educated and evolved, informed mind in whose very formulation of the question is already half the answer. The inquiry of our current developed Torah scholar stimulates and generates answers that bring new insight and understanding. As King Solomon said in his wisdom, who is like the wise man? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? The Chachomim explained, he means a Torah scholar. Who knows how to clarify his study? King Solomon continues, a man's wisdom makes his face shine. And the Chachomim adds, that's when he asks to the point and answers properly, in accordance with halacha. This is from Ecclesiastes 8.1, and this is also the Midrash Rabbah, uh, I think, um, um, and also commented by Rabbi Isaac of Toledo. <clears throat> As Rav Shimon Tov, Ibn Shimon Tov, indicates, this is also a fundamental extension of humility. He is not too haughty to ask information of anyone, nor does he consider it beneath him to answer the lowliest questioner. Number 43. He listens and adds to his learning. So, uh, Rabbi Shem Tov Ibn Shem Tov adds, and I quote, as analogously, flame catches onto a thick wick. End quote. This devoted Talmud Chacham listens with his soul to the Torah of his teachers until his spirit catches fire. Then in turn, he can transmit its light, adding his own paraphrase and explanation. Above all, uh, Mishnah emphasizes he listens long and well before he adds anything of his own. He makes sure he has learned and understood thoroughly and becomes imbued with the actual thought processes indicated in the Torah before he tries to speak in its name. Um, our Mishnah could also signify that the matured Torah scholar listens and continues to listen. He doesn't tire of keeping his ears open when Torah is being taught. He doesn't have an arrogance that, that makes him insist on self-expression, but keeps his attention span very short when it is on the part of an audience. Um, he doesn't declare his education finished. And he keeps his mind alive. And I quote again from King Solomon from Mishle 1.5, the wise man will hear and will increase in learning. Number 44, he learns in order to teach. This will inform us not only why this Talmud Chacham studies, but how. If a person learns merely for his own sake, he may give his lesson only cursory attention and stop after a superficial reading uh, like once over. Uh, that, he may feel, is, not, is, is good enough for him. But when he intends to teach others, he must gain a thorough grasp of the material, understand every point and every turn. This is, this is, uh, this is um, what we talked about before, 
If you want to, if you want to understand something, you have to be prepared to teach it. When you're prepared to teach it, you put in extra uh, study because you want to make sure you don't make a fool of yourself and not be able to understand what you're teaching. You can't fool your students, whose who's, you know whose perceptive minds will try to test you. You know, pupils feel a, a pride in challenging the teachings, not in a not in a, um, a, a nasty way, but just to try and add. Uh, angles that perhaps the teacher had not explained and therefore perhaps uh, promote their understanding. So he studies in order to teach. As this says, our 44th attribute is he learns in order to teach. Um, Number 45, he learns in order to do. So we've learned in various places. Um, I think in uh, Pukkei of us, chapter one, Mishnah seventeen. Um, not learning with doing is the main thing, and he who learns in order to act will be enabled to learn and to teach, uh, to observe and to do. Achachomim kept the principle well in mind. Often in the midst of an involved Talmudic discussion about Torah law, the question is asked, Lamai nafkamina, what practical difference can it make? If a division of opinion or a question on the debate can have no application to an actual case, a matter of law in daily life, it has no point. The oral Torah was not uh, to be a clever structure of academic study and theoretical discussion. It was to be a divine law in ordinary human life, in action and deed. Anything in the oral Torah worth discussing must affect in some concrete, tangible way our lives as Jews and people. The principle will affect the very way this Talmud Chochem studies. As Rabbi Shem Tov, Ibn Shem Tov, uh, writes, and I quote, You cannot compare the one who learns medicine merely to have the knowledge with the one who studies it to make it his occupation and to cure the sick. But the first will little heed if he makes an error, whilst the one who would engage in its practice must be alert and aware, forgetting nothing and altering nothing. So wise words from uh, Rabbi Shem Tov Ibn Shem Tov. 46. He makes his teacher wiser. Okay, that, we have to look at this. Just the very act of becoming someone's student. A person makes his teacher wise. Like I said in the uh, two, mis- two attributes ago, the importance of... Um, uh, a teacher gaining knowledge by trying to teach something that he has learned. He gains insight just by the action of uh, teaching his students. So, by converse, the student makes the teacher wise. He imputes wisdom to other people. And, uh, and the more learned and mature a scholar is, the better he can discern true wisdom in others and therefore choose his teachers with an unerring sense. Um, again, our Mishnah signifies that a good student actually adds to his instructor's wisdom. We know the statement of Rabbi Uranasi, and I quote, Much have I learned from my masters, but more from my fellows, and most of all from my students. This is from Ta'anis, uh, Daf 7, Omad Aleph. It's a two-way process. The more wisdom and insight a student evokes in his master, the greater is his gain in turn. One account in the Talmud shows dramatically how valuable a disciple could be. Rabbi Shimon uh, ben Lakish was Rav Yochanan's disciple and colleague. He fell ill and died, and Rav Yochanan was grief-stricken uh, to an extreme degree, and he even so much so that he stayed away from the Beta Midrash. Uh, eventually, the other fellow Chachomim sent Rav Elazar ben Padath, a student with a keen grasp of his learning, to console him and calm him. Whatever Rav Yochanan mentioned, the young scholar quoted something from his store of learning to prove the master right. 
hoping Rav Yochanan might accept him as a, his new disciple and colleague in place of the friend that he was mourning. Rav Yochanan cried, and I quote, Are you then like Reish Lakish? Reish Lakish, when I made a statement, he would raise 24 objections and I would give 24 replies. And of itself, the lesson would unfold. You keep saying something that was taught that supports your statement. Do I not know that my statement is fine and right? He tore his clothes and exclaimed, Where are you, Reish Lakish? Where are you, Reish Lakish? For he was grief. He was grief stricken beyond the bounds of reason. And unfortunately, Rav Yochanan, I think, died broken hearted, as recorded in Baba Matsya. Ahmed, uh, eight, uh, Duff 84, Ahmed Aleph. 47. He learns his lesson with precision. So, the Torah can be transmitted only from master to student in this sort of unbroken continuity. These nuances and interpretations and meanings can't be set down necessarily completely on paper. Uh, and to be grasped only by reading them. A mature Talmud Chacham knows that he becomes a link in a great chain, and you know sometimes his learning or teachings has to be face to face. So he trains himself to learn his lesson with precision, to realize and remember exactly what he learns in every instance, never adding or subtracting. This quality depends upon the transmission of the Torah without any error or loss. Uh, as it is written in Gemara Barachot 27b, whoever teaches um, something he has not heard from his master causes the Shekhinah, or the Divine Spirit, to withdraw from the people Israel. Um, so he has to be very precise about what he learns and teaches. He must not add or subtract. Keep it, keep it as it is and um, just transmit it as accurately as and as uh, convincingly as possible. Number 48, he quotes a thing in the name of the one who said it. It It's very important to give attribution. We know that um, we've said in previous attributes that you must mention the author of something you've learned uh, in order that their, their, uh, their spirit is raised and that even as it is mentioned, their lips move in their grave. So, we 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 have to know that um, you know if you don't uh, the Talmud Chacham does not give the attribution of who he's learning from he's guilty of genevat das or stealing the esteem and high opinion of others to which he is not entitled by creating a false impression. Um, our text indicates that you will not merely avoid. Genevas Das by saying, what I tell you now is not original with me, I learnt it. He will make sure to name the specific authority throughout the Talmud. Other Among Tanoin and Maraim, we find many examples. One Chacham quotes another, and often, as like it or not, the other gave the teaching in the name of a third sage. All the names are carefully recorded. And one who, finally, this is an addition, this is beyond the 48th, whoever quotes something in the name of the one who said it brings deliverance. So, to underscore the importance of the last of these 48 steps to mastery of the Torah, our Mishnah mentions an instance where it actually saved lives. We read in the book of Esther that after Esther became queen to Ahasuerus, Two royal servants plotted to murder the king. Mordechai found out and told Esther, his cousin and adopted daughter, and she told it to Akashverosh in Mordechai's name. Whereupon it was recorded in the royal chronicles once the information proved correct. After Haman set his plans in motion for the annihilation of the Jews, the king found through the chronicles that Mordechai had received no rewards. Along came Haman for the king's permission to hang Mordechai, and instead he received the king's order to give Mordechai public honor. Therefore the stage was set for Mordechai to replace Haman and save the Jews. Once Esther denounced to Ahasuerus, 
a people's would-be assassin. So a, a sterling example of the value of uh, crediting people for what for 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 things they have said correctly and uh, very interesting and in that vein i would like to uh, mention that these um, many of these lessons that i've given have uh, i'd like to attribute to irving brunim for his masterful ethics of si ethics from sinai uh, compilation of commentaries and his own masterful thought. Irving Boonim, um, a very, very worthwhile resource when studying Purke Ovos. And that brings to an end this, the sixth Mishnah of the sixth Perek. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. Very, very amazing, amazing expose of, of uh, over the last um, four sessions. So we look forward next time to continuing with Mishnah 7. Until then, we wish you a wonderful and blessed week.